Welcome to Power of the Tribe podcast. My name is John Connors. I'm the host, and I'm also the founder and head instructor of Connors Martial Arts. We're here in Norwood, Massachusetts. We teach Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai kickboxing, and mixed martial arts. And the theme of our podcast is if you want to make a major change in your life, if you want to lose weight, get in shape, gain more confidence, if you want to become the inner badass that you know is there, find an appropriate tribe. It'll make it so much more effective. And I'm here with my co-host, Dan Robin. How you doing, Dan? I'm doing great, John. How you doing? Have you been traveling at I all? I have not been traveling. Not traveling. That's unusual for you. Uh, Dan, we have a special guest today. Yeah, I'm excited to talk yeah? to her. Yeah? Yeah. Do you know much about our guest? I don't know bit? that much. You don't know bit. that much. So uh, our guest today is, I believe, 81 years old. I've known him for about, I would say, 19 years, I think, since 1999 is when I started and I would call him my student, but I would say we do private lessons on a regular basis. And um, at this point, it's more of a collaborative effort than sort of an instructional effort. And uh, and he likes to train for self-defense, jiu-jitsu for self-defense primarily, not for sport jiu-jitsu, which is probably more common today uh, when people train Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, but he's just a great guy, super interesting, and uh, his name's Herb Cavett. Hi, Herb. How you doing? Very good. Now, Herb, is this your first podcast that you've ever been on? Not only is it my first podcast, I never heard the term until <laughs> about two weeks ago. Uh, I, I'm sort of out of it. You know, 81 years old, I'm not hip. When uh, Prince died a couple of years ago, I asked my wife, who is this purple prince who died? <laughs> I had no idea who it was. Uh, another time we were biking in, uh, in, in Estonia and we couldn't find a room. And I, I asked, went from one hotel to another and finally someone said, well, there's a Metallica concert in Estonia and the whole, all of Scandinavia is coming. I said, Metallica, what's that? I had no idea. <laughs> so as far as the podcast, this is quite a new revelation to me. But we had a little conversation walking in here where you won't, you're not going to believe this. He's already invited to do another podcast. <laughs> so he went from not knowing what podcasts are to being on two, two in a week. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of our typical questions that we ask people is uh, we ask guys about their fascination with fighting and self-defense in general. But I think we like to start as early as possible. What is your earliest memories of sort of fighting and what it meant to, to fight or defend yourself or, or – Perhaps if you were bullied as a young child, do you, do you have any memory like that that you well, can share with us? This has been the defining uh, factor in my life. When I was probably eight or nine or ten years old, Floyd Miller hit me, <laughs> and Floyd Miller used to threaten me. I, I, I say he used to beat me up on the way to Hebrew school. He really didn't, but I was terrified of this kid. He was a small kid, but he was tough, and he set my insecurity, which led me years later into martial arts and self-defense. And for about 60 years, I've been looking for Floyd Mill. Of course, I can easily take him out. This <laughs> is not a problem. There. So, so this was in Brooklyn? This was in Brooklyn. Some yeah. kid uh, scared me. Yeah. And I was always insecure. I was kind of a wimpy kid. I was not an athlete. And in those days, uh, athleticism was baseball. If you were a good baseball player, mm. you were popular, you were an athlete. And I wasn't very good at baseball. I wasn't very good, I suppose, at timing sports. And uh, I didn't become an athlete until uh, deep into adulthood, until I uh, probably in my 30s. Mm. When I was in college, I did sign up to learn judo. I wanted to learn how to fight. I wanted to <coughs> feel more self-confident. And there was one s martial arts school in the New England area. It was called Nishimoto School of Judo. And Nishimoto uh, was uh, some oriental fellow that taught this guy. And the fellow who was teaching the class gave himself a black belt and taught uh, hip rolls. That's all he taught, hip rolls. N now, the, the instructor, was he Nishimoto or is he an no, American guy? he was guy? Just, a, just a guy, a tall, skinny this guy. This is like the late 50s or something. This was in 55. So wow. you're saying the whole school was just the hip rolls. It was like a one move. <laughs> hip rolls and a, a minor <laughs> amount of Aikido stuff. He'd so show if you, you didn't get the hip roll on an opponent, it. you were done. Well, he's following that. What is that the, famous Bruce Lee line uh fear the man not the yeah. man that's done ten thousand kicks the man that's done one kick ten thousand times right. so 
He was 10,000 hip rolls. <laughs> 10,000 hip rolls. Hip rolls is probably the most useless self-defense <laughs> move in the, in the world. Actually, after learning these hip rolls for a year or so, I went into an intramural wrestling competition at college at MIT. And, of course, I got the living crap knocked out of me. <laughs> All I knew was a hip roll, and the guy got on top of me. I, God almighty, did I get beaten. <laughs> so, so you tried that in, your, in college. Uh, and how long did you spend at Nishimoto's, do you think? I was probably a year or two yeah. learning hip rolls. Um, and funny, actually, uh, as a non-athlete, I one day just happened to pass a shop and saw a sign in the window for fencing. I said, gee, I've always wanted a fence. Everybody's always wanted a fence. It's kind of interesting. You get a sword and you stick people with it. So I took up fencing. And, was and when was that? How old was do you about that? 30, 35, so oh, okay. 35 years ago, whatever that is. Now, when you were a kid, a lot of guys that we asked this question about, were they inspired? Some of them say Bruce Lee, and a lot of people say sort of superheroes. Were you fascinated with comic book heroes at all as a kid? Not that I can think Not of. Not that you can think no. of, yeah. But you also predated Bruce Lee, right? Like I don't oh, even absolutely, know yeah. Well, I mean, Superman, Batman were there, and a couple yeah. of the... Uh, stars i suppose but no i don't remember being fascinated by superheroes the thing that really got me into martial arts uh it was all very accidental after fencing for a while which is a very shallow sport in a sense the best athletes in the world don't fence they're playing baseball mm. or football so i was able to do fairly well in fencing so you could compete in fencing. i could compete i can go to yeah. the nationals every year and, and do tolerably well uh and then one day at a little health club i belonged to they started pushing me to sign up for a triathlon. I thought this was a stupid sport. Huh. And uh, I saw the list of names, and several of the names were crossed out. I said, all right, I'll put my name down. This guy will start bugging me. Stop bugging me, and then I'll, I'll cross off my name when he's not around. <laughs> so I signed up and got all enthused, started training for the damn thing, and there were 50 or 60 people in at the club. And the day of the competition, I won, the, I won it. I won my <laughs> first trophy. I was stunned. I said, by God, I found my sport. Huh. And How uh, old were you? So I lost track of this. Is in your 20s or 30s? I was, or? No, now I was probably uh, 45, oh, 48. Oh, in your 40s, okay. And I wasn't very good at any of the sports, but I was mediocre. Mediocre in swimming, mediocre in biking, mediocre in, in running. And that was enough to do well. And I entered my first real competition, the Bud Light uh, competition in New England, and I won my age group. I was stunned. I was you know, 45 to 50, I suppose, and I won it. I said, oh, my God, I found it. So I started doing triathlons quite seriously and ended up doing way over 70. And, and uh, You did 70 different triathlon 70 competitions. 70 different triathlons over 10 years. And in fact, I think in 19-something or other, someplace in the fi late 50s, 58 or so, I, I, went to the, I made the U.S. team and went to the World Championships. You mean in 85 or something? 85, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I went to the World Championships and got a shirt that said USA. It's one of the dreams of my lifetime nice. was to wear a USA on my chest. Of course, I got killed, and the World Championship was in Avignon, France. And uh, there were some pretty good competitors there. I didn't do particularly well, but it was a tremendous thrill. That's Yeah, I've seen that poster. That's really cool. He looks like a, you know, Bruce Jenner from the 70s or something. It shows him <laughs> running, and it looks really <laughs> impressive, yeah. Well, yeah. because of the training for triathlons, that led to martial arts. I was training, or I was doing an Ironman uh, triathlon one time in in New in uh, New Hampshire, and while I'm all alone, feeling kind of vulnerable and a little speedo, you know. So you're uh, training or you're competing? I was competing. In, you're at competing a, at a, in a triathlon in New Hampshire, right? And you're. You're like running at this point. I was on my bike. You're on your bike, but you're wearing like a bathing suit. Yeah, yeah a little so it tiny is. Speedo. It is kind of. You probably do feel vulnerable, right? And a, a car pulls up, a, a pickup truck with two bearded bums in it, and everyone's cheering you on. So I look at them and smile, and they say, "Get the hell off the road!" I said, "Oh my god!" And they tried to run me off the road. Oh wow! I was scared. I wanted to yell, "Stop and fight!" They they would have killed me. I mean, I didn't, didn't know how to fight. And, uh, but you could have run away from them well, and, in a car. and swam and away from them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you had a bike. Anyhow, <laughs> I said, this is not going to happen again. And I, now, uh, how, how old were you when this incident happened? So you're in your 50s maybe or something. Probably getting close to 60, 58, I, I'm guessing. All right. Maybe, maybe you know, I don't remember. I don't remember anything anymore. And so <laughs> you get to be 80, you forget everything. Today, driving over here, I... Forgot how to turn on my directional signals. I mean, this is getting serious. The whole brain is going. <laughs> what are you going to do? 
But this is t- this is amazing. See, I didn't know this, and it's an amazing uh-huh. part of the story to get into it. So you've been training 25 years, but you started in like 58. Because I hear people that you know. All oh, the he th- started his his martial arts training at age 58. Yeah, sounds and, like because yeah. you hear people 28 saying, you know, um, it's too late. Oh, for am me. I too old? It's too late for me, or you know, or 18 sometimes, you know, depending on how how seriously they yeah. want to compete. Dan, when I started. It was right before my 36th birthday, so I was essentially 36. And back then, Herb, I don't know if you remember this. In 1999, people would say, um, gee, I can't believe you're starting it at such an advanced age. Like, they thought 36 was old back then. I I think people have a different perspective now. Now they think, like, um, 36, you know, Brady's still playing at age 40, so people have a different perspective and expectation for older athletes. But... But 58, of course, that, that is much older than most people would start. Right. I just think it's a, the best example I've ever heard of not too, you know, not too late. Not too late. Don't yeah. think you're too old. Because I think, you know, I've heard, I can't count how many times people talk about how they're too old to start something. It's starting at such a young age. I've heard 22-year-olds talking about like, oh, I don't heal like oh, I did right. in high school. Yeah, people you know, have I, this I, I weird. You're always feeling like right. you're old. I've heard 24-year-olds like, oh, we're a little old to go out to a bar. And it's like, you've only been allowed to for three years, you know. Right. So there's think, this I think tendency people to think feel that, like you're old or past. Right. You're past. You've missed something. Or I have to young. start at age three yeah. to catch up with the Chinese or something. Or I'll never be world champion, which, which is sort of yeah. a silly take on things. Well, that's, you know? well, that's part of it, too. Some, some sports, maybe you need to start very young to be a world champion. But... Are you trying to be a world champion necessarily? You right. Know, maybe, you know, right. It, not a lot of people going into martial arts aren't doing it with the purpose of the intensity world of champion. sports. Uh, it's quite frightening. I have a grandson who started playing lacrosse at six, and he was very, very good. And you pretty much to, to make it in lacrosse. I mean, to get into a Division One college, he's only nine now. Uh, you have to give up your life. You have to huh. practice year round. You got to go to the the in, the competition is intense. Right. Insanely intense. Yeah, you almost can't even have two sport athletes anymore because you have to do them year round. You have to pick your sport very you know, young. You, you talked about uh, being too late to start. There's no data on 81 year olds and what they should do or how their bodies age right. or intensity. Every now and then you see something, well, older athletes at 60 should do this or should do that. Or, mm. or if you're at 65 and you run uh, you know, twi- t- times a year, it'll improve your bone strength. There's nothing on 81 years old. And sometimes it really amuses me that mm. there's, there's nothing out there. Right. That's also why I love the story of starting at 58 because I've heard it too where, you know, someone will say, Am I, I'm 33, is it too late? And someone will say, it's not too late, I'm 39. And then you think someone who's 50 is thinking, well, you 30-year-olds are talking about it, but maybe right. it is too late for me. But it's really, you know, not, you know, depending on your goals. It's too late to be world champion if you're – well, if you don't start thing. when you're yeah. 58, you're just going to be 59 the next year. So <laughs> yeah. you might as well just jump in and, and do it for sure. Of course, uh, the benefits from specifically martial art training or probably any sport really doesn't matter the age. Uh, the confidence mm. that you get from martial arts training is, is why I did it. I did it because of my insecurity. And over the years, having done this for you know, 30 or 40 years now, I feel supremely confident. Mm. It's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. When someone hunks a horn at me and gives me the finger, the adrenaline rush just doesn't come. I mm. look at them and say, excuse me, what's the problem? Mm. It's just wonderful, wonderful feeling. So, so let me take you back to New Hampshire. You're 58 years old. Floyd Miller's rustic <laughs> grandchildren somehow or something, his, 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 his inbred descendants come by in a, in a pickup and beep at you and I'm just running you off the road. So now you're like, well... I can't have this anymore. I got to go train martial arts. So, so where do you look to train? Wh- well, first, I took boxing lessons. Boxing. <coughs> there was okay. a local guy, and I took some boxing le- boxing lessons. And recognized fairly early that this was a sport, and very useless for self defense. Mm-hmm. But about the same time, uh, at a building that I owned, uh, Saroj Benjani and a, a karate guy wanted to open up a school, and he opened up a school at my building, so it was very convenient for me to take karate lessons. And mm-hmm. I studied uh, Taekwondo for years and got a black belt, and it was all kind of nonsense, just standing there pretending you're punching people. It was all very much make-believe. There was no real 
conflict or no real intensity. Mm-hmm. And so uh, did you, f- because of the lack of real conflict and real intensity, did you feel like you were not getting rid of that insecurity? Like, you, did you feel like it was not helping you? It's funny, I asked confident? somebody who had a second degree black belt at the time. I said, you know, I, I've got this black belt now, but I don't feel invulnerable. He says, yes, but you're no longer vulnerable, which was probably true. I mean, I didn't feel so. You, so essentially you made uh, progress in being effective at defending yourself, but you still didn't feel supremely confident. You still felt a little insecure. I had perhaps. never been in a fight. I had right. never really, other than the make-believe uh, uh, katas competition and nights mm-hmm. that we do. The katas are totally useless. Uh huh. But uh, by chance, I had a, a, a niece who was into Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and uh, we invited her to the school to put on a demonstration. And uh, that was the point where I met Roberto, and we started doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which seemed much, much more real than Taekwondo, because mm-hmm. here you were really struggling with somebody. So then, you're, so you're talking about Roberto Maia, who was my instructor as well, right. and he founded Boston Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So and then he came to your building as well, too. Right. He and that's came where there, the original rented, rented space was. Space. And I, you know, it was very easy to take lessons frequently because it was right where I was working. And how old were you then? About 60 or something? Jeez, I should have made a timeline before yeah. coming. I don't remember. <laughs> We'll well, how say long, around when did there. we meet? How long have you been doing this? We I started in 1990, January 1999. Uh, so I probably started uh, in 96 Two years. or 97. Yeah. yeah, very cool. So that's yeah, early 60s for you. Yeah. And it felt real to you. It was more real than Taekwondo, which right. you know, I never really made contact with, a, with an opponent. Uh, speaking of contact, I just remember some Brazilian fellow in the lock locker room there, and when he took his shirt off, he had this scar coming down his arm that was horrifying, evidently in a competition. Someone had tried to rip his arm off, and there it was. I looked at that. I said, oh, my God, this boy's for real. <laughs> so he had a surgical scar. Yeah, about eight inches long. Oh, wow. And uh, how long did it take you to feel uh, – Invulnerable, if you will, or where you felt real confidence when you were training in the jiu-jitsu. It, it came slowly. It was not something overnight. Yeah. Uh, the only time really uh, became totally confident is when we started working one-on-one, pure self-defense. All sports, whether taekwondo or Brazilian jiu-jitsu, is a sport. There are rules. You're not allowed to poke someone's eye out. You can't knee them in the groin. Certain things are just mm. not allowed. Uh, and without those... Uh, Without those, you don't know self-defense. Mm. Now, Dan, have you ever trained with Herb? A li- it was a while back. A while back. Of, of, um, well, I haven't trained. You, you, uh, Herb recently took a little time off, but uh, you know I've trained with him for many, many years, and I can attest when he grabs you, you're grabbed. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, holy cow. When Herb gets – he overhooks my arm. I can't get my arm back, so um, I, I think it's amazingly effective. I, I, I th- we were talking about this in another podcast. If we got to follow Herb around with a video camera, because if somebody ever attacks him, we got to get that on video because <laughs> the guy is going to be shocked out of his mind when uh, everything goes completely wrong for him. You know. I tell you, the reason <laughs> I hold your arm so tightly is I'm afraid you're going to pull it out and hit me. <laughs> Um, so we're up to our 60s. So you did Nashimoto's for a couple of months. You did some fencing. Then somebody tried to kill you on the triathlon. So you did Taekwondo, got a black belt in that, and then you found jiu-jitsu. And um, you basically been training jiu-jitsu for 20 years or more. At least. Yeah. And it's been the last five or seven with you that has changed my my out attitude towards fitness and, and self-defense. Yeah, and of course, jiu-jitsu, when you started, it was it was really thought of more as self-defense. Right? It was, mm. it was uh, no rules. Uh, you know, like the Gracie started with no rule, uh, you know, no rules competitions because it was a self-defense art. Right. And that's changed a lot. But now, Herb, did like you watch the early UFCs? When the Hoist early Grace? ones I did watch. Yeah. And that was a revelation, of course, to see that the strikers 
were totally dominated by the uh, jujitsu people. Right. I remember the very first one where some poor guy got his, some poor sumo wrestler got his teeth knocked out. Oh, and, that's right. Um, <laughs> and there's obvious, you know, in a conflict, take someone down and, you know, do what you can on the ground. A lot more effective than standing there punching. Even to this day, if I get into a conflict, uh, all I want to do is go to the ground, unless he's very big, in which case I'll just run. But right. um, that's how interesting. Something else I have learned, people like uh, Jack at the club, who's a power lifter and very, very strong. If someone weighs 280 pounds and knows something, you don't want to go to the ground with him. I mean, no matter how mm. much you know, that's a tough guy to overcome. Mm. <laughs> very challenging. Uh, yeah, Hoist Gracie was so impressive in those early UFCs. If you, you can watch it today. It's, I find it still impressive. He was like this baby-faced guy. He wasn't that big. I think they said he was 175 pounds maybe. I, I don't know how tall he is. He's pretty good height, He's I something guess. like 6 feet, 6'1". Six, right. But those guys I remember he was my exact him. size. He, and that, so that really stood out to me when I watched those first uh, ones. Right. I was like, this guy's my size. Exactly your and size. And he's winning the whole thing, yeah. Yeah. He's my height and weight, yeah. And these guys are trying to kill him. Yeah. Yeah. Very impressive. I did yeah. meet these. I, I met the Gracies through Roberto. When yeah. They came to put on seminars. He introduced me. And uh, you're right. You know, 170, 175 pounds. Not at all impressive looking. Right. But his results were just amazing. Yeah. Uh, that's what got me into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, of course. But now, like you said, um, the UFC is a little different now. And people are interested in the sport. And Jiu-Jitsu is different now. Right. I mean, right. no one is doing, no one is using jujitsu for, you know, about, I remember original jujitsu would even have, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they'd have taking a knife away from someone or, you know, they would be sort of like, it would mm. cross that line a little bit, you know, right. it would be sort of like drill, you know, getting grabbed from behind or getting, you know, bear hugged mm. or, you know, things like this that were really self-defense oriented more so than, you know, the sport. My fear in self-defense is being ambushed. That, to me, is the most frightening thing, you know. I was down in uh, New York a couple, maybe a month ago or so, and I was walking down the street, and I realized, my jiu-jitsu is great, but it's, I don't see somebody sneak up behind me and crack me in the side of the head. I, I'm going to be in trouble, you know. So that sort of situational awareness is the first and most important thing for sure. Actually, the thing I, I just talked about, I was reading – uh, a study by a psychiatrist on on self defense. Mm -hmm. He said the things to watch out for is a place where young men gather. Mm -hmm. The second thing to watch out for is a place where alcohol and drugs are being used. Obvious. And the third thing was a, a place where the boundaries are unknown. Maybe there are two gangs or on the border of a country, mm. and you don't know what quite what the situation is. And the fourth thing to avoid was a place where you don't know the rules. You don't know the rules of etiquette and convention right. and things like this. I was biking once in Tunisia with my wife. Women don't bike in Tunisia. I mean, hmm. people are horrified on the street. Hmm. Um, and, you know, if I was to go into a, a bar, a gay bar or a lesbian bar or something where I don't know the rules, not, not safe. You might right. have offend uh, somebody's sensibilities or something. I think this is an important thing for self-defense, too, which is the best – self-defense are these rules which sort of sound more boring so i i mm. give my examples my i had a friend who contacted me he knew that i trained and he said my son's been getting bullied you know what should he learn basically how should he learn to kick the ass of the bully mm -hmm. and i replied like well you know there might be rather than him learning to fight did you try these kind of you know talking to the school did you talk mm. to the parents did you teach him to avoid and he was very disappointed. He was like, well, these are very boring. <laughs> so he was like, I want to learn. I thought you were going to tell me how to do a good spin kick. Right. Where he could just kick the guy's teeth out. Is there some and kind like, of throat well, punch he can learn? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, an eye gouge is what he wanted to hear. And the truth is about, you know, real self-defense, you know, right. especially for kids or for – it's sort of how I you avoid yeah, the I tell situation. guys, don't be at a bar at last call. You know, yeah. nothing good happens then or immediately after. And don't get out of your car in a row race situation. If you did those two things, I, I would think that the majority of opportunity for you to be in a fight is, is going to disappear. If you're not in a bar past midnight. Right. And Avoidance yeah. is definitely a thing. I mean, we learned this a long time ago. If you get into a fight, one of you is going to jail and one is going to the hospital. Right. Not wonderful outcomes for either of you. Now, Herb, did you see that video of our student Abraham who got robbed at the mobile yes. station? that was great. Yeah. yeah. 
And he got a little black guy, too, and the other guy got a black guy. But you're right. One guy went to jail. The other guy went to jail, the guy that was trying to rob him. Uh, but, but mercifully, nobody got seriously injured. Yeah, it's just you can't really win. Like like I said, people like the, they just love the image of being trained so that you just beat someone up. And mm. But truthfully, it's it's just better to avoid it if you can. I mean, I can I, see what ha- if, if I got into a conflict. I was in a, a traffic thing a few months ago. I was with my grandchildren and I stopped at a stop sign. It was a four way stop. And when I uh, pulled up to the next light, the guy is yelling and screaming at me. I pulled alongside. I, I said, what's the problem? I had no idea what he was upset about. I had stopped. He said, you didn't stop on the stop line. You went over the stop line. He says, you want to get out of the car? <laughs> he was young and he was a bald guy. He's big. And I just looked at him and just drove off. And I was thinking, if I got out of the car, I have no idea who he is, if he's a policeman, if he has a gun. I have no idea. If I got out of the car, I had to drop him instantly, which he wouldn't be right. ready for. I drop him instantly. And what is the result of that? If I dropped him and choked him, I go to jail, even if it's only for a few hours, and maybe he goes to the hospital. It just doesn't pay. Oh, no, and it could be potentially disastrous. You could literally have gotten killed somehow, yeah. or well, you know, your grandchild's with you. The, the, something could happen. It's just, it's, there's no, um, there's so much downside and really no upside. Yeah. I think there's a kind of a well known story in the martial arts community. There was a, it's a, was he a Muay Thai champion, right? That guy, in, in Alex a, Gong. Yeah. And yeah. So he was world class. I mean, I think he was a technically a world champion. Yeah, world champ Muay Thai. So, like, really, really good. And he got in some kind of road rage or something. No, like I th- I'm not positive, Dan, yeah. but my clearest understanding of the incident was I think the guy might have, like, sideswiped his car that was parked in front of his gym. And he, I think he went out of his gym, like, almost in his workout gear. And went over and confronted the guy through the window, and the guy shot him and killed him. That's what, that's how I remember it. I, yeah, and I the guy he got stabbed, which makes it even like I'm not sure because like, he di- he died of some fatal injury from a weapon. But for me, it was even yeah. yeah. But even that, it was like it just a guy had a knife, and I think the guy was like a, you know, it was just, I forgot who he was, but it was some kind of Monday. You know, it was like he's a postman or you know something like this he's not like another trained guy or some sort of killer it was like some guy with a knife i think the just, guy might have been had a mental illness issue or something like this yeah but so someone you know alex gong's at a level that none of us are going to attain or very very few of us mm-hmm. and he just got killed yeah by an average Such person a tragedy. You know, yeah so you can't think you reach some level where you're safe mm. yeah you, you had used the word invulnerability and uh, uh that's a probably a dangerous concept to even to consider it yeah all it can do is the main purpose of self-defense is psychological, I think. Mm. Just feel good about yourself. That little conflict I had with the car, when I drove off, there was no adrenaline mm-hmm. rush. I felt fine. Hey, I did the right thing. I, I think cars are particularly dangerous because there seems like uh, there's a factor of uh, anonymity where people think they're anonymous for some reason, and they're not an individual. So... Sometimes they say and do things that they would not do if they're walking down the street. You know, they, they wouldn't be as aggressive or insulting or as provocative as they are in a car for some reason. And then I think if I'm in a car and somebody, you know, brings a car in front of me where I have to stop short. So I think there's two things that happen. One is I get a stress response because I'm afraid for my life. Like, oh, my God, this person could have fatally injured me with the way they're driving. And then I think there's a more subtle but also insidious feeling of I was somehow socially insulted, like this person cut in front of me and I'm losing social status. So it's something that's not conscious, but that really triggers sort of an animal reactive behavior. So the combination of I almost got killed and this I got a social insult, those and the anonymity of being in a car, those three factors seem to come up and it creates crazy behavior in people. Right, right. In the car too, you're surrounded by a steel shell. You feel pretty safe. You feel a little you can invulnerable. Honk your horn, you can right. yell. You're if you're walking down the street and somebody was walking by you and accidentally stepped in front of you and even stepped on your toe, you wouldn't get as enraged yeah. as in a car. You would just say, "Oh, excuse hey, me. excuse <laughs> me," and uh, you know you might get a little annoyed, but it, it probably wouldn't come to blows at all. But uh, you can go on YouTube and find all kinds of people. This fascinates me too, Dan. If you go on YouTube, Herb, you'll see people getting road rage, pull over, and they start fighting. And neither one of them know how to fight 
at all. Right. <laughs> and, and I'm like, why were they so eager to engage in a fight when they have <laughs> zero <laughs> ability and zero training? So it's, quick to fight with no yeah, reason they, to have any confidence. Right. N yeah, they should not be confident. Yeah. And uh, somehow they thought that was a good idea. And, uh, yeah, and sometimes one guy does know how to fight. <laughs> the other guy attacks him, and, he, and it just goes horribly wrong. But um, You mentioned yeah. that just yesterday for some reason I – clicked on something from a bike site that I get, Bicycling Magazine, and it said uh, someone attacked a biker with a machete. Oh, my God. And the biker took away this machete and killed the other guy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I watched it. It turned out it was in something in China. It wasn't quite as dramatic as that was. The guy wasn't on a bicycle. I think he was on a little motor scooter. And oh, right. And someone jumped out of the car with a machete and somehow dropped it, and the other guy picked it up and chopped the other guy to death. <laughs> oh, my God. But this is what we're talking about. You lose your life over nothing. being cut off or, you know, something mm. like over nothing. Yeah, it somehow triggers a not a rational part of our nervous system. Haven't you, but I felt it on my end, too. Like mm -hmm. someone, the littlest thing, like someone doesn't go. Someone's in front of you and they don't go when you feel there's a lot of space. And right. like I get real, <laughs> you feel this like momentary rage. Mm. Like of just like, what? You know, like. And then later, you know, two seconds later, I'm like, what am I doing? Why am I getting so... Who, it does, who even cares? It does even feel a like a, a natural response. Yeah. Get, what I try to do to mitigate that is um, I have an elderly aunt who's since passed away, but before she passed away, she'd be driving around and she would drive very slowly and cautiously. So I try to think of her whenever I'm behind somebody dawdling be along. That's when I change it was my kids. Like, you know, uh, when my kids started driving, uh -huh. I felt like, mm. well, this could be my kid in front of me. And I would like, I wouldn't, you wouldn't want, want somebody some... leaning on the horn on your kid who's yeah, trying to figure out how to drive. Exactly. And you don't know who it is. Maybe it's their But it's interesting. Our natural response is a very hostile one. And we have to use <laughs> our prefrontal cortex <laughs> yeah. to not be a complete jerk. Not everyone does hostile. that. Yeah. That's so true. Once in you know, one of my travels in the Orient, there was a book on the room on Buddhism. I you know, read it out of desperation. And the whole Buddhist attitude of just relaxing and taking it easy and not worrying about things. Every now and then when I get a stressful situation, I'll say, hey, Herb, be a Buddhist and just relax. My wife laughs at this because it's very rare that I can relax like that. <laughs> but it does work. Now, let me ask you, you've done a lot of traveling. So Herb's traveled the world on bike trips. Um, how many countries do you think you've been in? A lot. I, I, people ask me that all the time, certainly 50 to 70. I've been every place from Madagascar to Mongolia. In fact, I just signed up for a trip to Albania. I said, who the hell goes to Albania? But I want You've to... not been to Albania before. No, but I'm going to How Albania. How many countries are there? A couple hundred, 200 or something? I don't know. Yeah. Um, they keep splitting up. So, you know, it's, it's an endless right. project to go to all of them. And, and um, let me ask you, can you tell us when you felt the most vulnerable? When were you in the most danger on any of your trips? Do you ever feel like this could be bad? Uh, the most dangerous one, I had no idea that it was dangerous. We were dry biking on the uh, Kashmir, on the Pakistani-Indian border, going by all these uh, gun emplacements, artillery and machine gun positions. Uh, my wife, we started in Srinagar, which wasn't on the itinerary, but we couldn't fly into the place we were supposed to fly into, so we flew into Srinagar, which is probably the most dangerous city in the world at the time. My wife is at home reading the newspapers, and 80 pilgrims were murdered on a train and they were blown all this stuff is happening and we were just biking blithely along <laughs> with no idea that there was any danger whatsoever i have this image in my head i don't know if it's accurate of like these like people like in the machine gun nest like pointing at each other and you're just like biking past <laughs> with your wife like <laughs> like pedaling past like making sure your helmet's yeah, secure helmet, properly yeah, helmet. yes i don't, I <laughs> don't remember ever, ever being feeling threatened or ever being frightened uh another very silly uh, episode very very hot I was biking in Israel with a military group, and we got to the uh, uh, West Bank territories. This was not Israel. This was the West Bank. East Bank, I'm sorry, East Bank territories. And a lot of the people went ahead, the fast riders, and it was 127 degrees on my thermometer out wow. in the sun. It was hot. And I decided not to get into the bus that I would ride it, and I started riding, and suddenly I realized I'm in the Palestinian territories on a bicycle all by myself. There's no one in sight. I was, this is not, not a good idea. And just then, this one uh, Israeli uh, former paratrooper came along. He was much faster than me, but I got on his tail drafting, and I wasn't <laughs> going to let him out of sight until we got back to Israel proper. 
that's very and so you've never been robbed or anything on all your trips no no do you ever feel like physically immediate threat like someone is confronting you oh yes yeah. one time very interesting situation I was in Nairobi first day we just arrived my wife's taking a nap I went out and started walking the streets of Nairobi and a kid comes up to me and says oh where are you from and I, I know this gimmick it's you know obvious overseas speaking good English I said I'm from uh, Boston he says oh Boston I've just been accepted at college at MIT I wonder if you can help me I said well I went to MIT I certainly can help you what would you like to know now were you wearing any MIT no, gear or anything no probably a pair of shorts and yeah. a t-shirt Anyhow, we start walking along, and I keep pressing him. How did you get into MIT? And he's talking scholarship, and when are you going to go, and where did you study? And, and finally, i s looking at the neighborhood, which is deteriorating a little as we're walking, and I said, well— Now, he was like? leading you someplace? More or less. Okay. Strolling, did but— Did you believe him? I knew <laughs> enough about this kind of yeah. tout— not to believe him. You're thoroughly. a little suspicious. But this might have been a poor kid who did get into MIT mm. and really needed help. So I said, oh, you know, I'll do what I can to help him. So I said, well, what would you like to know? And he says, well, uh, finally, he said, you know, it's not polite to talk on the street. L let's go to a cafe someplace. Well, by this point, I'm 80% sure that I'm about to get mugged. Mm. Uh, and yet there's still a small probability that he's a kid that really needs help. So I'm thinking, how can I test him? How can I test him? Finally, I said, hey, tell me. How many places do you know the value of pi to? He says, what? I said, pi, as in pi r squared, 2 pi r. He said, oh, I got very upset. He said, oh, I'm sorry. I, you know, I haven't been to MIT yet. I haven't learned anything. I've just been accepted. Said, Goodbye. I was back to the sunny streets. <laughs> we haven't covered pi yet in my <laughs> math training. That's very funny. Now, you told me once before that, uh, am I wrong? You went to the Soviet Union. Many times. Yeah. I was scared then, but there was nothing I could do physically to, to uh, avoid any conflict in that time. I was when scared. was that? In the 70s? It was in the 70s. I went working with some of the dissidents and refusenik groups. I'd bring them stuff and take out messages back and forth. Uh, at one point, I went to a town of Vilna, and here there was no U.S. consulate. There were no other people, no other tourists around. I was by myself. I checked into the hotel, and uh, uh, there's a floor lady on every floor that watches everything. She knocked on my door and said, they want to speak to you down at Intourist. So I went down to the Intourist office. Intourist takes care of tourists in, in Russia, and they, you know, they're polite and they're nice and they're westernized. And I walked into the office, and behind the desk is this blue-eyed Gestapo agent, a KGB agent, and he just said to me, we don't want any of your activities here. And I was alone. I, I was scared to death. Not so much that I was scared instantly, but I saw the interest people were scared to death of this guy. Mm. They were sweating. And uh, here I was, and he told me, we don't want you talking to anybody. We don't want you visiting anything. That Go to the ballet. We'll get your tickets for the ballet. Don't do anything else. And I walked around in the streets after that for many hours deciding what to do because I had some people I was supposed to meet there, deliver some things to them, vitamin pills and Nothing of particular importance, but it would have given them encouragement that someone mm. was watching out for them. And I thought that if I did visit these people, these guys are going to search their apartment, which mm. is very unpleasant. They rip everything apart. So I decided to take the tickets to the ballet and not uh, knuckle under to them. Mm. So th that guy scared me. How was the ballet? That was great. <laughs> Second row center, yeah. you know, good seats. <laughs> so they did get you good seats. Oh, yeah. So there's that. That would intimidate the hell out of me. Yeah, you know, there's some sure. situations where self-defense is not going to help you when you're yeah. up against mm. the government. Mm. That yeah. seemed like the wise move, definitely. Oh, sure. Avoid you're all alone there. And also, with all these stories, it's sort of like in hindsight, it doesn't. you don't have that same stress response, so it doesn't seem as... I got a know, little stress it, response when <laughs> he was telling that story. <laughs> but it's sort of like you know, you're, you know you made it out. Like at the time, you don't know you're going to make oh, it right. out. Oh. People do that with a lot of these tales of like terror. It's sort of like they don't realize, like, you, you already know they made it out mm. because they're telling it to you. But, like, at the time, you don't know how it's going to end. In the so. 70s, leaving Russia was quite an experience. Um, that's what I found out what a totalitarian state is. Before you could get to the airport, you had to go through some road checks on the, on the road. After you got to the airport, of course, you had to show your passport and your visas to get into the building. And after you got into the building, when you went through passport control, it was a steel cage that would fit one skinny person, and you went through so no one could sneak through. 
all of these controls. And then when you went to get on the plane, you were going up the steps to the plane, there was another guard right there looking at the final third copy of your visa, comparing that to your face. I mean, it was, the door closed and everyone was a little bit relieved. And then when that plane, when the pilot would announce, we've crossed into, we've left Soviet airspace, the whole plane would cheer. I mean, wow. Tremendous <laughs> relief when you got out of Russian airspace. But then you went back? Went back four times. <laughs> yes. <and I> got, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, after the last time they you wouldn't cheer let, every time you left yeah, oh yes yeah. so the last time they wouldn't let me back in I was a persona non grata they wouldn't give me a visa that's pretty cool yeah. he's like a secret agent Dan what do you think no, I was, all my sure secret agent anymore. fantasies were being filled out we had to, <laughs> we'd have pictures ripped in half and you'd match them with somebody and on one of the trips on the third trip I met with some of the dissident artists and managed to uh, <clears throat> collect uh, all of this dissident art turned it over to someone from the American embassy, and it was smuggled out in the embassy pouches. Uh, I remember sitting at a restaurant with the kid from the embassy giving him this artwork, and the Russian KGB agent was leaning way back to listen to our conversation. His ear was practically in my soup. Um, but nothing happened when I finally flew out and landed in London. I remember thinking that they didn't search my baggage or anything else. When I opened my bag, I realized it had been ripped to shreds, and they mm. cut out the linings and everything else. Really, kind of were doing secret agent stuff. They had uh, like KGB following make, you and make believe. It was yeah. kind of fun. <laughs> I'd be afraid I'd get stuck with the poison umbrella or something, right? <laughs> yeah, isn't that their trick? How they get Actually, rid of people? <laughs> one night I remember it was cold in Moscow. I, I would try to go in the winter when they didn't expect uh, uh, the very few tourists in the winter. So I suppose they were more uh, alert. But I remember one night unable to get a taxi back to my hotel and no buses running, freezing cold in the Moscow street. And the uh, KGB car that was sort of monitoring me gave me a ride back to the hotel. <laughs> so funny. So Herb, um, I think I think I'm gonna, we're going to wrap it up now because I know uh, you're a little bit limited of time. But I want to acknowledge you. You're 81 years old now, right? Right. Your birthday's in April. Is that what it April. is? April. I'll be 82. Pretty good, right? So. Um, what I'm so impressed about you is that you're always still looking to learn and looking to grow. He's just trying to get better all the time. So that's really an inspiration to me. Um, you know, I'm in my 50s and, and I want to keep doing what you're doing uh, when I'm your age as well. And we took a little hiatus from your training, but I assume you'll be back. I had this, this, abdomen, this hernia operation. Yeah. So I've been out for a month. Uh, one of the things I enjoy most about training together is how we develop techniques that mm. are not normal. All of a sudden we say, gee, arm bars really are not too effective for self-defense. So we concentrate on chokes, which are very effective. Well, that's what uh, Abraham choked his attacker out unconscious and, right. and waited for the police to come. And I think he said he, he ended up putting the guy to sleep a couple times before the, yeah, yeah. the police he actually showed up. Every time he'd wake up, he'd just put him back to sleep. And yeah. he's literally 120 pounds, so... I mean, that's pretty good proof that it, it can work. Great um, story. Yeah. One more thing about Herb that I was just thinking to your point about injury and coming back. I imagine it's very easy to especially think, you know, going back a ways, you'd think I'm in my 70s now and you have injuries or something that keep, keep, takes you out of the gym and it would be very easy to say, okay, I'm done. And you just keep coming back. You know, even now you had surgery. <laughs> He's like You're a zombie. 80s. You can't kill him. <laughs> but I mean, people take excuses, right? You say, my knee's out. Sure. I'm going to stop. It's easy to make I'm too excuses. old. And, so, and, and I mean, you're, I can't think of a better example of someone that just doesn't take it's any true. excuse. It's uh, when I was in my se late 70s, I said, okay, I'm going to hang in there till I'm 80. And that, that'll be enough. I'm going to quit mm. when I'm 80. And now that I'm over 80, I said, why, why quit? I'm enjoying this much too much. Herb, you shared something with me. I don't know if you want to share it here. Here about something that really reinvigorated, reinvigorated your motivation to continue training. Uh, <laughs> it was something about your, you, I know you love your grandchildren and, and they give you so much joy and, and uh, with that experience, but you told me something else about your great grandchildren, right? They're just grandchildren, not great grandchildren. But you said you Oh yeah, that, that's my, my my goal now, as I said, if I can just hold a great grandchild in my arms, then I'll be ready to die. Now this is quite a a reach since my grandchildren are, you know, seven and ten years old, but uh, perhaps it'll happen. So that so what do you think? So you you need a, at least another twelve years or something Easily for that. Well probably more like twenty. And I can make it. 
I but I think that's an amazing goal, right? Because you're you're really tapping into sort of your uh, your what your DNA is looking for, your selfish gene. It's a, it's a primal thing, but I think that's brilliant. The the injuries are something that give a person an excuse, and you just have to overcome it. I had hernia our, our surgery a couple of weeks ago, and before that, I damaged my spinal. That was kind of a serious injury skiing, and I've had three rotator cuff operations. Each one yeah, puts you out for six mm. months, but. Uh, Somehow. But you're still skiing, jujitsu, biking. Uh, biking, running, swimming, every day, swim, lifting weights, and lifting weights a couple of times a week, and trying to do the stadiums at Harvard mm. every week. But don't you feel that if you do stop, it's really the beginning of the end, right? You stop, you die. Yeah, yeah. You stop, you die. As I said, there's very little information on people over 80, on sports and physical fitness over 80. You know, they usually talking about, well, when you're 65, you should lift weights or you should walk mm-hmm. 150 steps a week and all this nonsense. There's nothing on 80-year-olds, but I'm finding as long as you keep going, the body stays healthy. And I imagine you eat very healthy as well. I'm a fanatic. Yeah, I, I bore, think that's critical. I bore my wife and, and uh, <laughs> in-laws to the, and uh, son-in-law and daughter-in-law to death because I'm, I'm a nut on, uh, on healthy, healthy eating. I think it's so important. You know, I had a conversation with my brother about it. He's like, "Yeah, I think it's about seventy percent of it is what you eat." And you know, I told him, "Jim, where you're sitting, it's a hundred percent. You know, <laughs> j- just eat healthy, and whatever a- activity you do will be a plus. But if you if you don't eat healthy when you're over a certain age, you're really uh, swimming upstream. It, you're really it's not going to be uh, effective. It's not right. the way to do things. Look at the statistics. I mean, the obesity epidemic in the States, the diabetes, everything that happens just from eating sugar and eating mm. crap. Yeah, it's essentially poison. Yeah. yeah. Well, Herb, you're an inspiration to me, and I hope everyone who listens to this will be inspired as well. I'm sure they will be. What do you think, Dan? Are you inspired? Yeah, I keep saying it. I mean, I can't <laughs> think of a better example. I mean, start like, like I said, starting at 58 and then going through operations and not being in your – Late seventies or eighties, having an operation. Herb's had a lot of his shoulder back, operation, and too. then coming back to the three, gym. Three shoulder operations. Yeah, uh, and each time operation. coming back. Coming back. He's. Um, it's like a horror movie when you <laughs> just when you <laughs> can't the, stop him. The monster's dead. He comes back. Comes KGB back. couldn't stop him. <laughs> Next time I see Dan at the club, I'm going to challenge him. I, I, Definitely uh, okay. choke him out. Yeah. Palestinians couldn't stop him. <laughs> Indian Pakistani war didn't stop him. That's it. Yeah. Just keeps coming back. Well, actually, I think growing up very insecure has its benefit. The mm. guys who are top athletes as kids, eh, they get fat when they're thirty. Hey, it's over. I was on the football mm. team. You see it so often, mm. and uh, I was a zero until I got into my thirties. So it's been staying with me. So you're still okay. trying to prove something a little bit. Yeah, I can't wait to get into a fight. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right, let's end it there. So thank you everybody for listening. Um, please. Share this podcast with your friends. Please go online and and review it and rate it. And uh, please listen again next week. And if you want to learn some Brazilian jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai kickboxing, if you want to come in and train with Herb, um, get choked out by an 81-year-old, I'm sure we can arrange something like that. And we're here at Connors Martial Arts at 180 Kerry Place in Norwood. Our website is Connors, C-O-N-N-O-R-S-M-A.com. And we'll... We'll see you next week.